Good morning. Let me read our passage for today. Uh, real short, we're going to read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Uh, these are f- maybe familiar passages to some of you, but um, f- familiar verses to some of you, but uh, we're going to read through them. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Read it again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. One more time. And if you want, you can read it aloud with me this last time, okay? Ready, set, go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Uh, This is God's word. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray that you would show us what it looks like to lean on you, to lean on your wisdom, your love, your goodness. Um, I pray you would dissuade us of our own self-sufficiency and reliability in ways that would make us uh, deeply depend and lean on you instead. Uh, So I pray, Father, that you would speak uh, and that you would uh, give me wisdom and what would be helpful for your people and for me. We really love you and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our theme for this year is Joshua is the church theme guy. <laughs> oh, eight, oh, oh, a, a challenger approaches. Aiden has taken on the new mantle of the church theme memorizer. Yeah, <laughs> good job, good job. Um, if you guys were paying attention when Dan was talking, <laughs> you would have known that the church theme is to trust in God. Uh, so this is a very simple, uh, from, from, the out, uh, from the outside, it seems like a very simple theme. Uh, you could even say that this theme is trite or cliche. And so people will use this when people are going through difficult circumstances and you're like, oh yeah, all this terrible stuff is happening. And they're like, oh, just trust God, you know, trust in God. Uh, and so if we don't try to unpack what this actually means, It will be a phrase that has absolutely no content whatsoever. And honestly, sometimes the way Christians can use this is trusting in God means just shut off your brain, stop talking, stop asking questions. Seriously, this is the way people can use it. That's not what this means. Um, And so today, last week, or sorry, a few weeks ago when we first started talking about the theme, so uh, we read through 1 Peter chapter 5, and you know the various verses say stuff like, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under his mighty hand, that in, uh, at the right time he may exalt you, casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. And so that, on that, uh, in that verse, we see a reason why we can trust God, and what it looks like to trust God. To look to trust God means to be humble before him. And that means, I use this definition of pride and humility. So to be proud is to displace God by putting yourself on the throne of your life. Uh, I'll say that again. To displace God by putting yourself on the throne of your life. That's what it means to be proud. It's, it's saying, I got this, God. I don't need you. And then to be humble means the displacing of self by the enthronement of God, where you're saying, God, you might be possibly a little bit smarter than me. You might be a little bit more wise than me, more powerful. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense for me to say, I'm going to trust you to organize my life. And then the third thing we kind of said was our anxiety When we have an overstress and anxiousness about the future, about things in our life, that anxiety comes from a dis-ease being the ones who are on the throne of our lives. You get me? We are uncomfortable being on the throne of our lives. If you are in control 
and everything depends on your ability to control, to prepare, to work hard, to be smart, to succeed. If it's all on you, that's a lot of pressure. And we intuitively understand how much pressure that is, and so we freak out. And the reason we're freaking out is because we were not intended to be on the throne of our life in that sense. We were intended to put God on the throne and us to be, in a sense, the people who are cared for by him. And so the way that we cast our cares is the way that we trust God is every single time you have a care or worry, to cast it on him. And that word means to chuck him the ball. You know, here's my care, I throw it to Chris, Uncle Chris, I no longer have the ball. And I'm saying the ball's in your court. Like, you gotta do stuff now. <laughs> you know, you gotta make the shot. You gotta make the last second shot. Uh, that's what it means to trust God. This week, we're going to talk about a different aspect of trusting God. And I got three points. Uh, we're gonna talk about why you should trust God. Uh, we're going to talk about what trusting God looks like. And then the third point is why you should trust God even more than the first point, okay? Why you should trust God, what trusting God looks like, why you should trust God even more, okay? Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Um, lots of people on the internet uh, have stated that the world we live in now is a place that is very distrustful of certain authorities, okay? And my suspicion is because of the invention of Googling. So uh, I'm gonna show you what it looks like to lean on your under understanding. And this is, so this is an image that I was thinking about. Um, the reason, how, how much, uh, the reason I use this image is because um, over the last few years, and well actually it's not just the last few years, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, what do you call it? Um, I'm going to throw shade at my dad a bunch in the sermon and there's a small possibility he might listen to it. So that'll be kind of fun, but we'll see what happens. So, uh, my dad is a very, very, very smart guy. How many varies was that? Very, 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 very. Was that four smart? Very, four very. He's very, he's a very, very smart guy. He's a very, 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 very smart guy. And, uh, yet... Uh, he does something when, that many of us do when we go to the doctor office. The doctor will look at him and say, oh, you are unhealthy in these given ways. And then the doctor will say, uh, here is my regimen for you to do to improve your health. And in the last three or four, three or four years, that's been like very serious. Like my dad had a pretty serious heart attack not that long ago. Uh, he's totally fine, and, but it was really interesting to see the, the contrast between his actions after the doctor visits, after he had his heart attack from before. When he would go to the doctor before, he would always say, oh, those doctors, you know, they don't know what they're talking about, because I read this article on the internet about keto, the keto diet. Uh, my doctors want me to lose weight, but they don't understand how like insulin resistance works, and so I'm going to go on the keto diet. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to do their give uh, do their advice. Now, we are totally like this in almost every area of our lives. Our default position is to lean on our own understanding, which means when we it, it, we have a very hard time acknowledging the possibility that someone might be smarter than us and might have more training, right? And so my dad going to the doctor, leaning on his own understanding. After my dad had a heart attack and the cardiologist or different people saved his life and then they did the surgery, he's really healthy now. Um, and then they're saying like, oh, you have to do these practices to maintain your health. Um, all of a sudden he was very open all of a sudden. Like, wow, maybe I should actually listen to doctors. You know? Now, you guys are laughing. But if you are a man, okay, I'm, I'm being, I'm making generalizations, but we, like, I almost feel like all men are like this, including me. Um, when we, we do not like listening to doctors. Uh, and the reason is because we want to be self-sufficient. We want to understand why 
And so we ask questions like why. And then I, so this is, this is what I always, uh, and when I talk to doctors now, they basically will say this, right? Every time they go, someone comes into their waiting room and someone, give, uh, someone tells them their symptoms, they continue to say, oh, on WebMD, I looked up this condition called blank, and I think I have that. And the doctor should be like, oh, okay then, I guess I'm not necessary. You can go ahead and diagnose yourself. Or another, another thing I, I wish doctors would do is they would say, um, oh, so you've gone to medical school and you've done a residency. So then, oh, I guess I'm not needed. Why don't you just, yeah, just cure yourself, right? Doctors complain about this. Everyone is so smart all of a sudden because they can look up stuff on Google. And that is the most foolish thing in the world. Now, okay, I'm not saying doctors are infallible, but they probably have more training than you do. They probably have more expertise in the area of medicine than you do. And so therefore, what it means for you to listen to a doctor is when they give you advice that you don't understand, because you don't have the capacity to understand because you didn't go to medical school, you have to lean on their advice without understanding why to some degree. You get me? You don't understand the workings of cellular biology the same way they do. Or you, you're not like an infectious disease expert. So you, like, even if they told you, even if they tried to explain to you what's going on in your body, you don't even have the cap capacity to understand it. And so the only thing you can do is take their advice without understanding fully and do it. And as a society, we are atrocious at this. But it makes a lot of sense, okay? It makes a lot of sense. So our relationship with God is very much like going to the doctor's office and trusting God just based on the difference in expertise between us and God necessarily means God will tell us to do things that we don't understand. You know what I mean? There is a difference in intelligence between us and God and we don't have the capacity to understand. We can't even understand our doctors, and God is way smarter than our doctors. So uh, there's a meme called Galaxy Brain. You guys know Galaxy Brain, right? Uh, so when someone, for all you people on this side, <laughs> what Galaxy Brain <laughs> means is, um, it's, it's basically like, Someone does something really ingenious and smart on the internet, and they say, oh, that was so galaxy brain. You know, like, oh, um, did you know that when you're pouring out something, the most effective way to pour it out without spilling is to just completely tip the cup all the way over? If you try to go like this and then go back down again, you're going to spill it all over, but it's so galaxy brain. You, like, take the pan and just flip it all the way over like that. Whoa, galaxy brain. Well... Here's the thing, God made galaxies, and God made your brain, so who's the real galaxy brain here? <laughs> I guess it's not God, because he made those things. He's even better, he's bigger than the galaxy brain. He made the universe. He's the universe brain. So then, just based on this, does it make sense to trust God? Does it make sense to trust God even when you don't understand? Let me give you another reason why you should not lean on your own understanding. So let's look at the, let's look at the phrase and the image that the, um, the author uses here. Lean. Don't lean on your own understanding. Uh, let me use this example. Okay, so what does it mean to lean? To lean means to place your weight on something else. Right? So the, the majority of your weight and center of mass should be pointing in a different direction and put on something else, right? So let's pretend for a second I'm leaning on this. When I'm leaning on this, the music stand, I am not leaning on the mic stand. When I'm leaning on the mic stand, I'm not leaning on the music stand. It's not possible for me to lean on the mic stand and lean on the music stand at the same time. In the same way, it is not possible, based on this verse, to lean on your understanding and lean on God's understanding at the same time. You get what I'm saying? You have to choose one that you lean on. And to trust in God means ultimately you believe that God knows better than you 
And then, like the doctor's office, you are going to take steps and actions on his word that you don't necessarily understand. And you are trusting, you are leaning, you are relying on his advice more than on your understanding and capacity. And this absolutely makes sense. So the first reason is because God is the universe brain. The second reason is because you dumb, okay? And when I say you dumb, I'm saying we are all dumb. Uh, there is a really funny study. So, okay, do you want the funny one or you want, okay, I'm, I'll do the other one first. The first reason we're dumb is because our perspective is so narrow. So uh, there is a New York Times bestselling author, journalist named Morgan Housel. He wrote really influential uh, personal, kind of personal finance money books. One of them is called The Psychology of Money. If you're interested in this, I would recommend you read everything by Morgan Housel. So he wrote a book called The Psychology of Money, and his chapter titles are kind of statements about the way we think about money. And his first one is really interesting. His first one is, no one is crazy. So his thesis is, people do super crazy stuff when it comes to money, but no one is crazy. What he's saying is, if you were able to inhabit their personal experiences, you would understand more why they do the things that seem ridiculous to you regarding their personal finances. Um, and so he says something like this, uh, your personal experience, your perspective, makes up 0.000000001% of all the things that have ever happened, but they determine around 80% of your, the way you think the world works. You get me? So let me put this in money terms. Uh, there, there are two different people who invest in Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, blah, 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 blah. Uh, your personal experience investing in cryptocurrency may vary. I am not a trained investment professional. Don't listen to the sermon and take this as investment advice. There might be one person who invests in cryptocurrency like at the very, very beginning. And so someone gets like 100 like Bitcoins or whatever, and they're worth like nothing. Uh, and then they hold on to them for years and years and years, and all of a sudden, they have $100 million. Now, their experience with Bitcoin is very, very positive, and so they'll say, oh my gosh, cryptocurrency, it's so great, it's so awesome. The problem is, that is based on their personal experience, and there are thousands and maybe millions of people who have had a different experience with cryptocurrency. So, for example, there's someone who, uh, who starts investing in cryptocurrency, um, at the very top of the price, and they throw in their life savings um, into cryptocurrency, and then it crashes, and they lose 95% of their, their net worth. This is a tragedy, right? And for them, their personal experience says cryptocurrency is a scam. You need to stay away from it, right? So Morgan Housel is saying, I am just little Daniel walking around, and all of my life experiences make me think I know what's going on in the world. But I have experienced basically nothing because all of humans over all of human history have had different experiences than me, and yet I think I can understand the world. And then here's the crazy thing. I think I can make predictions about the future based on my very narrow, limited personal experience, right? So I can tell you, I can give you great adva financial advice. It's really interesting. So when he talks about people's views towards stocks, uh, if you invested in 1999, before the dot-com crash, uh, you will, many people online talk about how their parents invested in 1999, and then they lost a huge chunk of their money, and so from that moment on, their whole attitude towards stocks has changed, where they're like, I'm never investing in stocks again. I'm going to keep it all in cash. But if you were someone who invested in 2010, 2010 was like this incredible run where if you threw money into anything, basically you were going to gain a lot of money from it. And so those people think, oh, I know what stock, the stock market is. I know it, how it works. You just put money in the stock market, you're going to make a ton of money. But that's all based on your limited vantage point, okay? Now, you can apply this to almost anything. You can apply this to your relationships. Uh, you can apply this to your sexuality. You can apply this to, to your view of what's right and wrong. You can apply this to what feels good and what doesn't feel good and what's good for you and what's bad for you. Our experience determines our intuitions about what works in the world, 
but our experience is so limited. And so therefore, it makes sense to trust God when you don't understand because he's the universe brain. He knows more than you. He has a top-down view, okay? He has a top-down view. Um, I love playing uh, a specific type of video game. It's called a real-time strategy game. Uh, so there's like the first-person shooters where you see the gun and the gun is like shooting people. So that's a, a first-person perspective where you only see what a person on the ground could see around you. A top-down perspective is you are like God looking down on this, these cities and these soldiers and you control them and you play God. And the thing about that is you can see so much further than someone on the ground would be able to see, right? And so, for example, the map is really big and there's this army like over here on this side of the map and the, this army is facing in this direction. They don't see any army coming because they are looking from their perspective. But I, as the god of the game, sees the army coming from over in this direction so I can make decisions to do the right thing based on that information, right? So in the same way, why would you trust your limited first-person vantage point with what decisions you make in life when you could instead get information and wisdom from God who has the top-down view? Your perspective is very narrow. God's perspective is extremely wide and he can see things that you can't see. And so therefore, you might not understand why God is saying, oh, you better get your bow and arrows ready because there's an army coming. You're like, no, there's no army coming. But yeah, I can see it. God's like, I can see it. Uh, you don't understand. But if you listen, it'll go better for you than if you don't get ready for the army to attack you, right? Second reason. Uh, you dumb, we dumb, we always think we're smarter than we are. So uh, the, I, was, I had a lot of fun looking up examples of this. There was a study in 1977. There's a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm not going to talk about it that much, but the Dunning-Kruger effect, in 1977, they um, surveyed a bunch of university professors. And I love making fun of <laughs> university professors. This is like an ongoing joke that all the not university professors make for the university professors. My brother-in-law is, is a professor. Um, my college roommate is a professor. I can make fun of them because... Uh, so, uh, out of the professors interviewed, 94% of professors said that they were above average teachers. You get me? 94% of professors. And that's so ridiculous, right? Like, that's such a high number. It's, it's not even like 70%. It's like, oh yeah, professors are slightly overconfident in their teaching abilities. It was 94%. Basically every single professor thinks that they were better than at least 50% of the other professors. But software engineers, just you wait. Another survey interviewed a number of software engineers at the same company. And the results of the survey were this. 32% of software engineers at this company thought they were better than 19 out of 20 of their other coworker software engineers. 32% thought that they were in the top 5%. They thought they were better than 19 out of 20 software engineers. Now, you might be saying to yourself, oh, I'm not a college professor, I'm not a software engineer, but this is a relatively well-established phenomenon uh, that has survived meta-analysis and like, like longitudinal studies. Like, they've done a lot of work on this phenomenon. So basically, we think we're smarter than we are, and we have a really hard time admitting what we don't know or understand. And so this is where it gets really crazy. Why would you want to lean on your understanding when our knee-jerk understanding of things is informed by our very limited perspective and we constantly think that we're smarter than we are, myself included. The book of Proverbs and this verse is saying that we need to reconsider um, the way we approach God. If we approach God and say, I am the one who knows more than you, I am the one who can use you as my consultant. So this is what Christians do. Um, many Christians, Dallas Willard talks a lot about this, uh, many Christians, ask the question, oh, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? 
and we say, oh yeah, that's a good question to ask. It's important to trust God as your savior. But what they don't ask, this is what Dallas Blurt says, is have you trusted Jesus as your teacher? And what that means is it's one thing to say God saves you, that's great. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty details of your life, do you actually arrange your life around the teachings and practices of Jesus? Or do you stay in control of your life? I want Jesus to get me out of hell, but I don't really trust him when it comes to how I use my money or how I use my sexuality or my relationships or whatever it might be, my work. I don't trust God with my work. I don't look for wisdom when it comes to this area of my life because I think I already know it. You get what I'm saying? Why would we trust our very limited experience? So what are some implications of this? Some implications are, if you want to break out of your perspective, you should read books. I can't believe I get to talk about this. I love reading. And if you want to get wisdom, you can actually take on the perspective of many other people who have lived before. You should read history. You can take on the perspective of civilizations that have existed years before you. Um, if you want to be smart and be wise, in order to do that, you have to say, maybe I don't understand all there is when it comes to X, Y, Z topic. And maybe someone might know better than me, and maybe I should consult them. Another example, you should read books. You should talk to people who know more than you, and that involves admitting that you don't know as much as them, right? So if you want to supercharge your learning, you have to know what you don't know, and you have to go out and get knowledge, get wisdom. And this is, all, this is what the book of Proverbs talks so much about. So to trust God means saying, God has wisdom I don't, and I want to be tenacious about seeking that from him. Uh, there's this really cool passage. If you want to look in Proverbs 13, uh, Proverbs 13, verse 14 and 15 says, blessed, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare to her. This guy is saying, wisdom is more valuable than gold, silver, jewels. And so if you have this valuation of wisdom, you should go after it and get it. Um, I was thinking of an illustration. I don't know if it works, but you're going to hear it anyway. Um, the U.S. government has decided that their citizens are not educated democratic people, and they need to get them to learn more about, you know, the Constitution, Bill of Rights. And so they've decided to institute the elementary school reading challenge, where basically in elementary school, uh, sometimes your parents will be like, oh, for every page you read, I'll give you five cents, right? And so you immediately start like, oh, I'm like reading so many pages because I'm going to make a bunch of money. So the government's like, that works really well to motivate people. I'm going to have, I'm going to pay whoever wants to do this. I'm going to pay you $1,000 for every 100 pages you read. And you can do this a total of 30 times every year. Okay? So do the math. Every year, you can make $30,000 by reading 100 pages 30 times. That's a pretty good deal, right? You would do that. You would be very highly motivated to read 100 pages 30 different times. Now, that's not enough money to quit your job if you live in California. In other places, it is. But for us, we still have to work. We still have to do it. It's not enough to live on. But if you do that for 50 years, you will end up with $1.5 million, right? So the long, slow, steady job of reading one page at a time, and then doing 100 pages, and then reading 30 pages, 30, 30, 30, you get $1.5 million over 50 years. What this guy is saying is reading scripture and getting wisdom from the Bible is a better use of your time than reading 100 pages to get $1,000 30 times a year. He's saying the gain you get from reading scripture and doing it incrementally, doing it consistently over a long period of time will benefit you far more than $1.5 million in your bank account. 
That's the argument that he's making. Now, that seems, maybe seems ridiculous to you, but think about it this way. With the wisdom from God and Scripture, it is possible that something you read in Scripture is the difference between you getting divorced and not getting divorced. It's, it's, the, it's possible that reading something in Scripture is the difference between having a happy life, having a contented, meaningful life, and being depressed and aimless and not knowing what to do with yourself. Do you see how that's more valuable than $1.5 million? And so if God has the vantage point where he made us, he created us, he knows exactly what is good for us, not only that, he is accessible where he has revealed his wisdom to us through scripture, doesn't it make sense to trust him? What does it look like to trust him? And this is where it gets challenging. Um, to, to trust God means to zealously, tenaciously, consistently go after wisdom from him. Rather than making decisions based on what you think, or even asking other people, what do you think I should do? You search God and ask him questions where you say, what do you think, God? Look at verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And another translation could say, in all your ways, submit to him. Which means when you're making decisions about who you're dating, about how you engage in a relationship, about what college you go to, uh, you might naturally have a great idea of what's good for you. I want to go to Harvard. But maybe that's not the best thing to do. Are you open to acknowledging God and saying, God, what do you want from me? Do you want me to do this or do you not want me to do it? In all your ways, acknowledge or submit to him. In order for you to acknowledge and submit to him, you have to know what he thinks, right? And the only way we can come to that is through scripture. Uh, well, okay, we can come to it through scripture. We can also come to it through the Holy Spirit giving us sort of a subjective sense of his leading and guidance. Um, but the most reliable way is through scripture. And so if we want to get this wisdom, if we want to trust God and believe that we are untrustworthy and unreliable, if we want to lean on his understanding, it means we have to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with scripture. Um, the problem with that is it means recognizing I don't have understanding that I need. It means recognizing I don't know what's going on. And we have a real problem with that because we're too proud. We go to the doctor, the doctor says, you have to do this is literally what happened to me before. Uh, this was a while back. The doctor said, you have to do an hour of cardio seven days a week. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. But guess what? Maybe it would actually help me if I did that. You know, maybe that would actually be good for me. But it's hard because it means getting off the throne and humbling yourself and taking consistent actions based on someone else's advice that you disagree with and might not understand. Do you realize how difficult this is? This is to say, I read scripture, and I don't understand why God would possibly say this. And then to trust him is to say, look, God, this is not easy, and this might be agonizingly difficult. But God, I'm going to try my best to go on your advice, not based on what seems right to me. There's a, another proverb where it says, um, a man's ways seem right in his own eyes, but the end is death. I might, be, I might be butchering it a little bit. The end of that way is death. This is where many people, myself included, the things we think are so good for ourselves, the things we think feel so good, the end of that is death. That's how serious it is. That's how serious it is. To reject God, to, to say, I get to choose what I want to do, this will make a disaster of your life and relationships. And this is the only reason that God instructs us in the way he does. When you take the flip side of this, God's commandments are not burdensome in 1 John. Uh, when we read the word, the Hebrew word for law, all throughout the Old Testament, the word actually uh, could be translated instructions. So when God gives us wisdom or instructions, it is instructions from a loving heavenly father who wants the best for you and who has a perspective that is greater than your perspective. 
And so you ignore his wisdom at your own peril, and to follow his wisdom will be great for you. Um, And so you see this all throughout chapter 3. When you acknowledge him in all your ways, he will make straight your paths. This is so beautiful and incredible. If you simply try to involve God in all the decisions you make, whenever you have cares, you want to consult him. You want to, and then not only that, you have decided and you are committed to regularly getting advice from God through reading scripture on your own with other people, listening to sermons, going to youth group, having an attitude where you're actually like, maybe this might be relevant for me. Maybe this might help me. Even just having that maybe, rather than saying, I'm not even going to try paying attention. That's a huge difference. And the moment you could say to yourself, let me try for a second not leaning on my own understanding. Okay, so it's a wisdom contest. God, I have my wisdom. You have your wisdom when it comes to the situation. I'm going to try doing it your way for a while and see how it works out. When you do that, it'll work really, really well. I can almost guarantee it. If you do it in the long run, I can definitely guarantee it'll work out well for you. Um, In the short run, it might be very difficult. But let me give you an example. So um, the Bible is extraordinarily relevant for our day-to-day lives, and one of the ways that I've experienced this the most is being married. So there's a passage where it says in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid himself down for her. And it says other things. Husbands, how do you love your wife? By laying down your life and serving and sacrificing for her. This is a, this is a passage that we went over in premarital counseling. And there have been many moments in my life where I don't feel like doing that. But I have tried and I've asked for God's help many times. God, can you help me love my wife by laying down my life and self-sacrificially serving her. I'm not perfect by any means, she would tell you that. But I'm trying, I'm trying. And do you know what? I think this verse has been an incredible source of flourishing and life in our marriage because I have tried my best to take God's wisdom and put it into practice. You get what I'm saying? This is so relevant, it's so good. What does it look like in practice? Um, It means allowing God to confront your assumptions about what's right and wrong. It means allowing and acknowledging him and involving him in your decision making. Uh, It means asking older, wiser people. This is something that I've tried to put into practice. I try to ask other people like when I don't understand what's going on, and there's plenty of times. Uh, It means letting go of control and learning how to be teachable, which is very difficult. It's very difficult. To be teachable is to say, I'm going to go through a regime, or sorry, a regimen based on the advice of someone else. And we do this in other realms. We go on YouTube and we see a fitness influencer. I I see a fitness influencer who says, I want you to do these workouts for this period of time. Uh, You do that. You submit to their regimen even when it's hard because you're like, oh, the gains will be great. But when it comes to God, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be a disciple of Jesus where we learn from how he lives? Jesus prayed. He involved God in everything. He got strength from his interaction with God. When he was tired, he went to God for energy and strength. He memorized scripture. Scripture is a source of comfort and encouragement. It was his heart. He bled scripture. On the cross when he was dying, he spouted out scripture that he had memorized and meditated on. Are we willing to get there? Are we willing to go through a process, a long process, by which we are familiarizing ourselves with Scripture, we're seeking to learn? And so I promise you, I'm not talking short term. Uh, I'm not saying you should read the Bible five minutes every day. If you want to do that, great. What I'm saying to you is if over the next 10 years of your life, you consistently listen to sermons, attend Sunday, go to Sunday school, go to youth group, I'm not saying you have to go every time. But in general, if you consistently attend, if you have an attitude where you say to God, God, will you give me wisdom? Your life will be absolutely transformed. You will grow in the areas that you need to grow. Uh, You will develop character and wisdom, the ability to relate to people in ways that are wise and loving that you never could do before. All of your issues, self-centeredness, 
pride, whatever it might be, when you bring these things before God and you say, God, can you change me? And then you do that for 10 years and then you submit to his training regimen where you learn from scripture. He will do incredible things for you. And it is not a short-term thing. It is a long-term thing, okay? So you have to be patient. You have to trust the process because to be real, it's not always fun. It's not novel. It's not super entertaining all the time. I know, you know, my sermons are not super entertaining all the time. I'm totally fine with that because that's not how learning works. You have to learn and you have to do something consistently even when it doesn't feel good because that's how any progress gets made in anything, right? And so if you have this attitude, if you remember why it's worth it when you're going through that difficult time, like I'm really tired from last night or I had a really tough week, it's really hard to show up, you can say to yourself, if I don't show up, God's totally okay with that. But if I go into a habit where I don't show up for a long period of time, I'm short-circuiting my ability to grow and gain wisdom. Um, and then the other thing is, if you show up with the attitude, if you just show up, that's great. The second thing you can do is, if you have this attitude, Lord, I don't understand things. Maybe you want to direct me and guide me in very specific ways this Sunday morning through what Daniel is saying, through what the passage is saying, if you have that attitude, the maybe God will speak to me in a very specific way, uh, you will grow. It'll supercharge your growth. It's the difference between uh, walking through the airport normally and then walking on the travel a later thing, the moving walkway, right? Uh, there's a big difference. You will grow much, much faster if you have the attitude like, I don't know. Can you teach me, God? Can you give me insight into your top-down perspective? God sees your future. He knows what's good for you. He's trying to point you in that direction. And he says this, in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make straight your paths. You get that? We worry about the path we're going on. We try to prepare our path, what college we go to, what job we have, who we marry. But what God is saying is, if in all your ways you submit to him, right now, he will take care of your future. He'll take care of your path. You get me? He will straighten your path. But if you go on your own, your path will be windy and difficult. You'll be walking through thorn bushes. You're getting poison ivy, poison oak. But then God will do the heavy work, the heavy construction work of clearing the path and making it straight and giving you clarity about where to go. And this simply means like obedience, right? If, if you're doing something that God doesn't want you to do and you know it, stop doing that, right? That's, that's what it means to submit to him. I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not trying to be trite. There's this process of repentance and confession and struggling, and that's really, really good. But when you can do that, you're going to supercharge your growth and wisdom. And, a, and if you hold on to your control and understanding, um, basically what Proverbs is saying is it'll go bad for you. Things won't go as well for you. Now, the final reason you should trust God apart from our narrow perspective, apart from the fact we're dumb, apart from the fact that God sees top down, uh, the final reason we should do this uh, is in verses three. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Uh, what this verse is saying is that the only reason you will trust God is if you first experience and know deeply God's steadfast, loyal, faithful love for you. All the things I'm saying don't make any sense if you're not a Christian. If you haven't experienced God's love for you, if you don't know the, the effort and lengths he went to save you, then it doesn't make any sense for you to obey him and trust his wisdom. But if God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. If he was willing to do that, then he is worth trusting, and even when you don't understand. So let me go back to the doctor example. You have a hard time trusting doctors, and so when the doctor tells you to do something, you can't do it. You just don't do it. But how about this? You have a serious heart condition, like my dad did, and you go to this doctor, cardiologist, and what they do is they say, look, I have, you have a rare blood type, and the only heart that will work for you is my heart. The heart surgeon says, basically, 
I will not only try to care for you, but I will give you everything to heal you. That's how devoted, that's how dedicated I am. If you want to be less extreme, this is like a, a doctor who wants you to lose weight. And the doctor says, we all know how difficult it is for people to do a, an exercise regimen. I'm willing to live in your house with you. I'm going to cook food for you. I am going to walk with you for an hour every day. I'm going to be with you and give you personalized treatment and guidance for the rest of your life so you can succeed. Wouldn't you trust and listen to that doctor who is that committed to you? God, as a Christian, already gave you his heart in the person of Jesus. Not only that, we talked about the Trinity. God has given you his Holy Spirit, who is literally the doctor, the, the wonderful counselor, who is walking with you in everything that happens. And so when you need advice, the Holy Spirit is arranging circumstances so you can get that advice that you need through people, through youth group, through scripture, through life circumstances. Are you willing to listen to the Spirit, though? Are you open to changing your direction? That's where, what repentance is. It means changing your direction, acting differently. It means changing your mind. It means saying, I'm wrong. You're right, God. And then acting based on this new way. If God is that loving, if he went through those lengths to die for you, can you trust him? And then the other thing, do you see wisdom, the wisdom from God as precious? When you learn from him, he has this incredible perspective, and we want to be in touch with his wisdom for our lives. And then he will make our way straight. We can trust him. We can not lean on our understanding. We are not trustworthy to lean on, but God is. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that you give us this wisdom in your word. Um, I thank you that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I pray you would help us as your disciples to learn from you, to trust you, even in areas we don't understand or extremely difficult. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to find other Christians around us who can help us on the way that you can give us the exact right person we need uh, to share with, to confess to, to receive encouragement and guidance from in ways that would help us deal with those deep areas of shame or issues that we don't want to tell other people and have a hard time letting go of. Um, I pray you would do that miraculously by your spirit, through your people, um, and that we would experience the joy and thriving and shalom and peace of following your way and your wisdom uh, and that would deepen our trust in you as we do that. Uh, we need you to do that. We need your reassurance. We need to know your love. We need your wisdom. Uh, we can't do anything without you, but we, we really thank you that you give us these things that we need. Um, help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.